Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. Or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So today's video is going to be a follow-up video on the first video that I did on the University of Idaho murders. At the time, all we really knew was the timeline of the night, the 911 call, and what we found in the scene afterwards. But now we have a good bit of more information to go over. As I said in the first video, anytime new information comes out, I will keep you guys all updated. But if you have not seen the first video that I did on this case, make sure you go ahead and check that one out. I go a lot more in depth about each of the four victims, who they are and where they're from and their backgrounds and things like that, which I think is very important to discuss when you're talking about a case. I also sort of laid out the timeline and everything like that. There is some information that was a little bit iffy at the time that I made that video, so we will be correcting some of that information here. So, as a reminder, the four victims include 21-year-old Kaylee Gonsalves, 21-year-old Madison Mogan, 20-year-old Ethan Chapin, and 20-year-old Zana Kernodal. These are all students at the University of Idaho who lived in an off-campus apartment in Moscow, Idaho, Kaylee, Madison, and Zana all lived together while Ethan was dating Zana. As we said in the previous video, we know that Kaylee and Madison went out to a bar on the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. They then went to the Grub food truck at 1.41 a.m. They were seen here on a Twitch stream that the truck was doing as people were placing their orders and they were making their food and everything like that. We are now able to watch this Twitch stream and now we can see that there is an unidentified man who appears to be walking near them. Then he stands by the girls as they order. This man does not order this entire time and then as soon as Kaylee and Madison leave, he is also seen leaving right after them. And again, he didn't order anything this entire time. So this is somebody who a lot of people are looking at a lot of web sleuths and I don't think this person has been ruled out by the police. However, you can see that there is a man in a hoodie next to the girls who did order his own food and I believe he was the one who was ruled out as a suspect. So going along with the timeline, after going to the food truck, Madison and Kaylee arrived back home at 1.56 a.m. after getting a ride from a private party. This person has not been named by police, but it is said that they were ruled out as being a suspect in the murders. Then we know that just before they got home, Zana and Ethan also got home at around 1.45 a.m. after being at a fraternity party. Then we know that the two other roommates who they lived with had been out of town that weekend separately doing their own things, but they too returned home at around 1 a.m. that morning, just before the four others returned home. Then between 2.30 and 3 a.m., Kaylee calls her ex-boyfriend Jack six times, and Madison also calls him three times, all of which go unanswered. Jack said that he was asleep at the time that these calls were made, so that is why he wasn't able to answer them. It was also said that the family absolutely does not think that Jack is involved and I do believe he was ruled out by police as being a suspect in all of this. He's just a grieving boyfriend, but we don't know exactly why all of these calls were made. That's still up in the air. But police did announce that these students were thought to have been murdered sometime between 3 and 4 a.m., it is believed that they were each sleeping at the time that this took place. Each of them did have signs of defensive wounds on them, but there was no sign of sexual assault. Each of them has been thought to have been stabbed with a Kabar-style combat knife, but the knife has not been found. I also saw that it was stated in one source that Kaylee's injuries were much more severe than Madison's or any of the other victims. It was said in some sources that Zana's defensive wounds were more extreme, which we discussed in the previous video could be because this person went after Ethan first because 
naturally you're probably going to go over the man first who is going to be stronger and be able to stop you from murdering the woman. So it's thought that the person went after Ethan, maybe Zana woke up and was defending herself against this person. But it was said that overall, Kaylee's wounds were the worst. Then going back to the timeline, later that morning, the two roommates who were not attacked, they had woken up. It was said that they had slept through the murders and that they didn't hear anything suspicious that night. I saw in one source that maybe they were awake during the murders, but I haven't seen that confirmed. It's pretty much accepted, I believe, that they were sleeping throughout this entire thing and that they didn't hear anything suspicious that night. They woke up just before noon that day before they found one of their roommates on the second floor unresponsive. By 11.58 a.m., someone called 911 using one of the surviving roommate's phones. Now, we don't know who the person was who made this call, but we do know that they made the report of finding their roommate unconscious. This was something that was discussed a lot in the first video. It was said that this scene was a bloodbath. There was blood everywhere it was clear that they had been stabbed. So why did this person report that they just found an unconscious person? Did they see them? Did they not see them? Some people discussed that maybe they had knocked on the door of the roommate and it was locked and that this person just was not waking up. So they thought that there could be something wrong. So that's why they called the police we don't necessarily know. We also know that they might just not be releasing everything that was said in this 911 call, so it's also possible that this wasn't all that the person said, but that it's just being summarized that way to the press. Something else that we do know that I mentioned briefly in the first video, but it was sort of just, you know, a sentence in an article that I wrote, now it's being more talked about. We do know that before this 911 call was made, the two surviving roommates called over a couple of friends to look at the scene. Again, we don't exactly know why. They could have just been like, I don't know what to do. Can you guys come look and see what we should do and help us out here? We don't exactly know. So it could have been one of the roommates who called 911 or it could have been one of these friends that was called over who used the roommate's phone who called 911. We don't know yet. That hasn't been released. When police arrived after this 911 call, they said that there was no signs of forced entry, but when they looked at the scene, they said that it was a bloody, gruesome scene. They were all found in their beds with multiple stab wounds to each one of their chests. Police initially came out and said that this could have been a crime of passion, but they also said that it could have been a burglary gone wrong. Then police also said that this seems to be a targeted attack and that there's no risk to the community, but again, we don't exactly know why that was stated. Now, I also want to mention that because, you know, a lot of people brought this up in the first video that I made on this, police found a dog inside the home, which is thought to have been Kaylee's dog. A lot of people were asking, you know, did the dog bark? Why didn't anybody wake up from the dog barking? Where was he during all of this? Well, it came out that the dog was found in a separate room than the one where the victims were found. There's no evidence on the dog. There was no blood or anything like that that could indicate that the dog had been at the crime scene at any point. So, I don't know if the dog normally sleeps with Kaylee in her bed, if he sleeps in a crate in a different room, if he has his own room that he hangs out in when they're sleeping. I don't know if he sleeps in the living room or something like that. All we know is that it doesn't seem that the dog was in the crime scene when it occurred or any time after, and the dog was in a different room when the police arrived. So again, it's not known where the dog was when this murder happened, but now that we have that cleared up, 
I will say that sometimes when people enter a house, the dog might not bark, whether it's trained to be that way or some dogs just don't bark when people come over. Some dogs are just very friendly and they'll, you know, go up to the person and lick them and then be on their merry way because they're just excited that somebody's there. Some dogs are a little bit better about saying like, this person shouldn't be in this house, there's something wrong here, let's alert, you know, my owners. And then there are some dogs who think everybody who enters the house is suspicious and barks. That happens to be my dog and my roommate's dog. So there are all types of different dogs. But now that I know where this dog was found, it makes me think more so that the dog probably just didn't bark when this person came into the house and that's why nobody woke up. So that's what I know about the whole dog situation. I know that was a big thing that we discussed in the comments on the last video, but if anybody knows more about that, let me know. But for now, that's what I think about that entire situation. So now moving on, along with the others that were ruled out as suspects that I discussed previously, the boyfriend, the person who drove the girls home, Police have also ruled out the surviving two roommates as being suspects. So a lot of people are very suspicious of them, but it's not thought that they're involved. They have been ruled out, so I don't know how they're ruled out once again, but they were. Since the start, the FBI has become involved in the investigation, and they said that they actually believe this suspect is a younger man who is a first-time killer, and they think that he knew at least one of these victims. FBI profiler Jim Clementine said, quote, This is an extremely risky crime for the offender, unless he knows one or more of the victims or he's been stalking one of them. Going into an occupied dwelling with six young adults, any of whom could have had a knife or a gun or a cell phone to call the police is extremely risky unless you know the circumstances inside. So going off of this, it's thought that this person might have been in the house before and they probably knew where everybody was or at least an idea of where the rooms were. There also was a little bit of confusion as to the layout of the house when I made the first video. So as we know, there are three stories within the house and there are six bedrooms. So the second story is actually accessible from the outside ground level via the sliding glass door. Then there is another sliding glass door on the third floor that can be accessed only from a deck that is on the outside. So I said in my first video that the perpetrator must have walked in and walked past the bedrooms of the surviving roommates who were on the first floor, but that isn't necessarily true if the intruder entered in through the sliding glass door, which was on the second level, and I guess the second level is the ground floor. Then, as we know, as we discussed in the previous video, this house had a keypad which requires a PIN number to enter into the home. This house is known as a bit of a party house where people were in and out all of the time. So it's thought that many people were able to access this house using the PIN number. So any number of people could have had access to that PIN number. Now, since the time that I made the last video, it has come out that Kaylee's father believes that his daughter Kaylee, as well as her absolute best friend in the whole world, Madison, that they were the targets of this attack. The two had been sleeping in the same bed when they were attacked and their bedrooms are actually located on the third floor of the house, whereas Zana and Ethan were on the second or ground level of this house. Basically, what Kaylee's father has said that because the easiest entry point into the house is that sliding glass door, which goes directly to the second level, that's probably where the killer started and where they entered the house. So, it seems that this person first killed Zana and Ethan. After that, he didn't have to go upstairs, but he chose to. He went upstairs and chose to kill the two girls who were sleeping upstairs. We don't know if he chose to go downstairs after that, but we certainly know that they didn't kill the two remaining girls on the first floor. So, that is what led Kaylee's father to thinking that maybe she and or Madison were the primary targets of this attack, 
Once again, we also know that it is thought that Kaylee had much more severe injuries than Madison. So that's another reason why it's thought that maybe she was actually the main target of this attack. Now, something else that came out about this case since I previously made the video is that Kaylee had actually told her friends and her family that she had an alleged stalker. Now, as far as I have seen, police say that they have looked into this report, but they haven't really gotten anything of substance from it. Her family is convinced, though, that this may have something to do with these murders. Now, it came out that there was one incident in mid-October where there were two men at a local business that Kaylee was also at. In the incident, the two men were seen parting ways, and then one of these men was seen following Kaylee. This man followed Kaylee out of the business and outside as she walked to her car. After that, police say that the man ended up turning around and did not make any sort of contact with Kaylee. But the police have said that they have spoken to these two men. They learned that these men were just trying to meet or pick up women at this business. They don't believe that this is indicative of an ongoing pattern of stalking. They do think that this is an isolated incident. There's no evidence to suggest that this is related to the stalker that Kaylee had talked about or that these two men are in any way involved in these murders. Then another thing to add is that shortly before these murders, Kaylee had actually posted an ad to Facebook Marketplace to sell her old car. Some people have said that maybe Kaylee ended up meeting up with someone who said that they were interested in buying the car and maybe this is where she met the person who she said was her stalker. Maybe this person could have something to do with the murders and this person, you know, saw Kaylee that day, you know, became obsessed with her, started stalking her, and then this is what happened. It's just another possibility of the many possibilities. The FBI has said that right now they are looking at the behavioral aspects of this crime they are trying to understand the victimology in order to try to find the motive. They need to know about the relationships that the people in this house had with each other and as well as with other people outside of the house. They have said that they're looking at their internet records, their cell phone records, and any surveillance video from any area around the crime scene that they can. They are also using the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, which collects and analyzes information about violent crimes in the United States. They said that this program can help match a suspect's DNA to that of a person that is already in the system. The system can also help to compare this this crime scene to any other crime scene across the nation to see if this is similar to any other crime that has taken place. Another thing that has recently come out just today as I'm researching it is that a single black glove was apparently found in late November just within the perimeter of the crime scene. Chris McDonoghue, a retired homicide detective who hosts a podcast called The Interview Room, he talked about how he discovered the black glove nestled among leaves in the snow outside of the house. He said that it seems like these detectives were not aware of the glove until he found it. He said, quote, Is this from the night? Is it random, i.e. somebody missed the trash can as they were walking by? Is this the suspect taunting the authorities by, you know, placing something like this hypothetically? So based off of this, we don't know exactly what the glove means. He has since handed it over to the police. He actually handed it over immediately after finding it, but we don't exactly know what this glove means. But it could be something left behind by the killer. It could be a red herring. It could have DNA on it. It could have something to do with this murder. We don't know, but this is just one of the many things that we know police are looking into. The police have come out to say that obviously the demand for information in cases like this is so great that sometimes the police departments will fill in the blanks in certain areas of a case 
just so they have something to say. They've said that, you know, if there is a statement that they realize isn't 100% true or if it comes out to be a little bit misleading, they will walk back that statement, which we have again seen happen multiple times throughout this case. Again, with them saying that there's no danger to the greater public, they don't know that because they don't have a suspect. Things like that. Again, they initially said that this could have been a random attack, but then they switched it to that it was probably a targeted attack, and that's when they said that there's probably not any risk to anybody else. They have also said that this could be a crime of passion, but that it also could be a burglary gone wrong. At the end of the day, the FBI just have said that they need to protect their information at all costs. They said that otherwise the wrong information could be released and this could cause the suspect to run. They don't know if this person is still in the area or not, but they've said that they need to be very, very careful with what they release and when. So other than this, this is the new information that I have learned since posting the first video. Police have said that they are still trying to investigate what occurred from 9 p.m. until 1.45 a.m. when Ethan and Zana were first at the party to when they got home. They said that any contact with anybody, any directions or method of travel, or anything else abnormal that took place that could, you know, help add to the timeline or the context of that night. They said that the biggest thing that they're missing and the biggest thing that they're trying to zero in on at this time is that timeline with Ethan and Zana because while we know a lot about what, you know, Kaylee and Madison did that night, we don't really know what Ethan and Zana were doing. We know that they had that frat party. We know that technically they shouldn't have been going to any bars because they're only 20, but it's very possible that, you know, shocker in a college town sometimes underage people get into bars maybe they had fake ids we don't really know so we can't rule out that maybe they did end up going to a bar maybe they didn't maybe they were at that frat party the entire night there are still gaps with the timeline with ethan and zana that police are still trying to figure out and they said that this information could be very helpful to keep putting these pieces together another thing that came out about this case on december 8th so about a week before i'm posting this video is that police are now looking into a car that they believe was at the scene of the murder that night. They are looking for the public's help in finding a 2011 to 2013 white Hyundai Elantra with an unknown license plate. It was reported that this vehicle was found in the immediate area of their home in the early morning hours of November 13th. Police said that they've received over 2,640 email tips, more than 2,770 phone tips, and over 1,000 submissions to an FBI link. They have collected over 110 pieces of physical evidence, over 4,000 crime scene photos, and they've also had over 260 digital media submissions, which are currently being analyzed. They said that they've conducted over 150 interviews this far, and they are still going to the public in asking help with the investigation. They stated, quote, we believe someone has information that will add context to the picture investigators are creating of what occurred. Your information, whether you believe it is significant or not, might be one of the puzzle pieces that help to solve these murders. So that is all of the new information that I have for you as of right now. As I said, I will keep making videos to update all of you about this ongoing case with any new information that I am able to find. I will close out this video with urging anybody, if you have any information absolutely whatsoever, please contact the Moscow tip line at tipline at ci.moscow.id.us or you can call 208 8837180 or if you have any digital media that you think might be helpful please upload it to fbi.gov slash moscow idaho that is all of the information that i have for today's video if you liked this video please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel and turn the notification bell to on i will be keeping you guys updated with any updates that come through this case in the coming weeks and months so make sure you keep an eye out for that and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of these updates. 
make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. I do follow a lot of the cases that I cover on Twitter and if there's any information as soon as it comes out, that is where I will most likely share it is over on Twitter. So make sure you go ahead and follow my social media as well. If you have any case suggestions that you'd like for me to cover on this channel, make sure you go ahead and use the Google form that I have listed down below and fill that out. That is a very streamlined way of getting those suggestions to me if there are any cases that you would like to see on this channel. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!